climate change is a global phenomenon. It recognizes no national or regional boundaries. I give, always give the example that India has today uh, emissions which can constitute something like 7% of the global volume. Supposing by some miracle, this 7% became zero, say tomorrow, would climate change stop? It would not. Because unless everybody else joins you in reducing emissions, your unilaterally taking action is not going to really deal with the challenge of climate change. So that is something that you have to understand. And the second element is domestic. Now, while we have to negotiate a climate change regime which supports what you want to do domestically, the good news is that for India's energy security as well as its ability to deal with climate change, you know, actually these are completely aligned. Why? Because today, most of your energy supplies in terms of oil, in terms of gas, even in terms of clean coal, these are all imported. And in fact, oil and gas, as you can see, is coming from a region which is politically also quite disturbed. And there can be, in fact, interruptions of your energy supply. So I'm uh, Sham Saran. I used to be India's uh, foreign secretary. And uh, thereafter, I was the prime minister's uh, special envoy for uh, nuclear affairs as well as for climate change. Uh, and I have retained my interest in climate change, of course. You know, renewable energy right now is fundamental to making sure that the clean energy transition is successful. Um, in fact, it is the central pillar under that. And the clean energy transition itself is fundamental to solving the climate change crisis that we find ourselves uh, in the midst of. Um, as far as India is concerned, uh, we've set a very uh, bold and ambitious target of getting to 500 gigawatts of installed renewable energy capacity by 2030, which is almost equal to the entire installed capacity of India's power sector from all sources, including coal, gas, hydro, nuclear, etc. So we have to recreate that only through wind and solar in the next seven years. So it's a pretty uh, ambitious target. Um, but it is also very important uh, because uh, uh, as, you, you know, as you see India's growth of power demand, we are growing very rapidly at almost 8% a year. And it is very important for us that this new demand is met from clean sources which are not polluting and which do not uh, put out any more carbon into the atmosphere. My name is Sumanth Sinha. I'm the founder, chairman and CEO of Renew, uh, which is India's leading renewable energy company, the author of Fossil Free. As far as our achievability of this target is concerned, I think we are well on our way. Uh, we already have close to 200 gigawatts of installed renewable energy capacity right now. Um, and there are a lot of investments that are going into the sector right now. Uh, the government is doing a lot to promote uh, the sector. We've recently had the announcement of the solar rooftop scheme uh, to install rooftop uh, solar, solar solutions on more than one crore households in India. Um, and there is a subsidy scheme that has been announced as part of that. So I think that will really democratize in some ways the installation of solar and the usage of solar and take it in some ways to the common man. Um, apart from that, we also have a lot of large-scale installations of both solar and wind happening all across the country. Uh, transmission is getting built out, um, capital is getting invested, new companies are entering the sector. So this is a very, very active area, a very exciting area as well, uh, and is very critical for us if we are to meet our climate change obligations. I think one area, for example, today, which is very relevant for us, is that of green hydrogen. Right? Green hydrogen inherent is more expensive than the alternative, which is grey hydrogen, um, by a reasonable amount. But we all realize and know that grey hydrogen emits a lot of methane into the atmosphere, which is very negative. Uh, and it also very often emits a lot of carbon dioxide as well. Um, and therefore, we need to replace that with green hydrogen, but that is more expensive. So, so we need government mandates to come in to force the users of grey hydrogen to convert to green hydrogen in the beginning thereby create the scale in the green hydrogen ecosystem in terms of new electrolyzers, understanding of how the technology works and so on to drive the cost down. 
and then we can you know have a much broader rollout so that's one example another example is that of batteries for example uh, batteries in um, to decrease the intermittency the cost of batteries is high today but as we have more and more installation of batteries you will find costs beginning to come down and that's when we can again have more large scale deployment so we can have those kinds of things that are driven by initially so to some extent by government mandates and then eventually the market will take over and drive the large scale implementation uh india was probably one of the first countries uh, in its national action plan on climate change actually gave pride of place to the national solar mission you know that was one of the first missions that we adopted on the argument that india is a country which has plentiful solar energy uh, and it should be able to utilize that uh, but there were two things that we came across so i think sumanth would agree with me that the two issues which are important in terms of the expansion of solar energy for example one is storage that he has already referred to and the second is space so when we adopted the national solar mission we also adopted a plan for a technological pathway in order to promote solar energy now in that for example we said the uh, aim of our research should be for each megawatt of solar power that you are generating how do you keep shrinking the space required for that because space is a constraint particularly in a country like uh, india we are already running into that constraint so how do we do that so this is where when we are talking about inspire you know how do we make sure that the generation of young researchers and scientists who are coming can they focus attention on this can they use for example nanotechnology to bring about that shrinking of space that uh, is required and second storage right now we are all dependent upon batteries but batteries are not the only way in which energy can be stored because intermittency is a problem how do we deal with that problem so one is a short term solution can we do hybrids can we link together for example solar energy for a certain period of time to modular gas based energy system which so when there is an instability it is easily able to take care of that so you need to think differently you know and various solutions can be possible because as far as battery is concerned today our reliance on imported batteries particularly chinese batteries is almost 100% now that's not in energy independence by any uh, any imagination one of the solutions that we have by the way come up with in india to uh, address the issue of intermittency is that we are combining wind and solar together along with some degree of batteries to provide much higher uh, capacity utilization factors otherwise you know sun when the sun shines sun you know solar energy is generated and wind whenever the wind is blowing but here we are actually combining all of that together and we are actually being able to sculpt now the generation profile that the distribution utility is seeking and that's a pretty unique thing that we've done almost for the first time anywhere in the world in india and uh, we can do it now because costs are cheaper and we have the expertise of being able to do that now as far as providing uh, uh, new opportunities for the youth look i think this is going to be a sector that is going to become one of india's biggest sectors uh, uh, as we go forward it is going to be um, i think an area where india is going to take global leadership and therefore for a young person Uh, there will be a whole plethora of opportunities all the way from things like electric vehicle charging infrastructure to developing and researching new battery technologies to researching new solar cell technologies to working on the deployment of uh, you know green hydrogen developing new molecules for things like sustainable aviation fuels and shipping um, you know fuels and so on i think what we need to understand is that this energy transition that we are talking about the transformation that he is talking about that is not costless it costs money it costs resources so we have said in the international negotiations we will do what we can within the limit of our resources but if we have to do this faster then we need a supportive international environment precisely because as i mentioned right in the beginning this is a global phenomenon what is today happening unfortunately is that this second part <laughs> of the global you know climate change regime uh, that i am afraid is actually going backwards 
you know. Uh, you have seen that even a modest amount of money of a hundred billion dollars that was promised as long ago as 2009 when I was chief negotiator on climate change and we fought to get that. Even that has not been delivered on till today. You know, what started off as public revenues to be transferred became everything, you know, philanthropic flows, uh, you know, private sector uh, flows, all those were put in that same uh, basket. So there has been an unwillingness on the part of those who are really responsible for the emissions which are stored in the atmosphere, which are causing <laughs> climate change, uh, a uh, unwillingness to really accept that historical responsibility and also to accept that today they are the ones who have the resources, they are the ones who have the technology, who can actually, if they wish and if they work together, can make a huge difference. But as I said, irrespective of what the global situation is, it makes sense for India to actually bring about that transition because for me, both energy security as well as climate change are actually promoted by that. You know, I think 2070 is a very far away time. I would say even much sooner than that. We will have a situation where, um, you know, drilling holes in the ground to bring out energy in the form of fossil fuels is going to be a thing of the past, maybe 30 years from now. Okay. And we will look back on this time, this, in some ways, this, this oil era of ours and wonder how on earth could humanity have been doing that. I suspect that's what's going to happen some years down the road because you'll have such fabulous technologies that your windows are going to be generating electricity, your cars will be storing electricity, uh, everything will be running on electricity rather than on energy, you know, more broadly. And, uh, and I think it, energy is going to become ubiquitous. I think people are going to be generating it and consuming it right within their homes and it's, you won't even realize that that's what's happening. But that's the kind of future I think that is going to emerge as we go forward and you'll have electric planes, you have, you'll have uh, electric or, or clean energy fueled um, uh, shipping and certainly mobility. So, and a lot of industries are likely to also start moving uh, away from you know, generating heat by burning fossil fuels and starting to generate heat from other sources like burning green hydrogen for example. So it's going to be a whole different world. I think whole industries will have to be reshaped, however. And all of that will happen, I think, much faster than we can at this point anticipate because technology is moving so rapidly around us. We can't even conceive of how artificial intelligence is going to impact all of these changes that are right now going on. But So it's a very exciting time, actually. And it's a very transformational time. And this is a, a, a transition that has happened maybe twice in our history as humanity, uh, an energy transition that we are now living in the midst of and all of that is going to play out in the next 20-30 years.